Let's take a look at limiting reactants, sort of an overview of limiting reactant types of problems. This may be fairly new to you in class, but this will be the lab experiment coming up pretty quickly. So let's take a look and see if we can get some grip on what's going on. And looking at the learning objectives here, we're going to try to identify a limiting reactant in a given reaction. You're going to be given an unknown. It has two components in it. You want to figure out which one is limiting based on how much product you got and a simple test for determining which one you ran out of. Uh, we'll talk about some in this power in this PowerPoint thing we will not but in the lab you'll be dealing with digesting a precipitate which is simply getting larger and larger particles so it filters better you'll be looking at two forms of filtration a gravity and a vacuum filtration as well those are much easier to see in the lab when you work with them and we'll also look at a macroscopic system I call it to model limiting reactant situations for example using big objects to see if we can get some kind of an idea of it the reaction we're going to study in here it looks really ugly. You'll see over here that we've got barium chloride dihydrate it's called. This hydrate just means there's two waters coordinated inside of here in terms of formula and molar mass and I'll just realize you're going to have in this you'll have a barium, two chlorines, and you'll have two water molecules as well. That's all a part of the molar mass. Similarly for sodium phosphate dodecahydrate same kind of thing and the products over here on this side the main one you're going to form is of interest to us is barium phosphate because it's a solid and that means that we'll be able to take it and, and filter it out, figure out how much it we actually got. And then you get other things that stay up in solution. Sodium chloride stays up in solution. And of course, water is just liquid water anyhow. And so what should be done, what will happen is you'll be given a test tube that will have in it barium chloride dihydrate and sodium phosphate. These are solids mixed together in, the, in your vial, unknown vial. And what you're going to do is take your mixture, add it to water. You'll make the precipitate barium phosphate and determine how much of that you made so they'll go back and figure out which one is limiting and also how much of each one you had in the starting point the process in simple numbers looks something like this and let's just think about it simply to start with so over here is we have three barium three moles think of it that way three moles of barium chloride dihydrate react with two moles of sodium phosphate dodecahydrate to give one mole of barium phosphate and so if you start with an example if you actually had three moles of barium chloride dihydrate you would need at least two moles of sodium phosphate to make one mole of barium phosphate and so when you look at this it's kind of simple in terms of the ratios and all you might get a sense too as you think about it that if I start with three of these if I have more than two of these I'm still going to run out of my three that, that'll limit how much I can make so if I start with three moles of this barium chloride with more than two moles of sodium phosphate, I'll run out of my barium chloride. I'll still only make one mole of barium phosphate. doesn't matter how many railroad cars or stuff I have. If I don't have at least two moles of sodium phosphate to react with three moles of barium chloride, I'm going to be sunk. I'm not going to be able to make more than my one mole. And you can turn it around the other way and view it from the sodium phosphate idea as well. So that's pretty much what it comes down to in this slide. And it all goes back to, to considering moles. And your expert's now at doing grams and mole conversion, so this shouldn't be much of a problem for you in this experiment. Let's look at one that's not as simple in terms of numbers. Just got to get an idea. Suppose I start out and I have 35 grams of barium chloride dihydrate. I want to react with 50 grams of sodium phosphate dodecahydrate. What we need to do is first get those grams into moles, because then I can go back to my balanced equation and figure that out. So we'll convert each of these to moles. You know how to do that already. If you've forgotten, you might go back and remember that if you take some number of grams divided by the molar mass, that tells you how many moles. From the balanced equation, recognize that you need more moles of barium chloride than you do of sodium phosphate. So here's my three and here's my two over here. I need more moles of barium chloride dihydrate than I do sodium phosphate dodecahydrate. And so if I don't have enough moles of barium chloride, then my sodium phosphate is limiting and vice versa. If I don't have enough moles of, barium, of sodium phosphate, then my barium chloride will be limiting. In this particular example, your number of moles of barium chloride dihydrate comes out to be 0.134, and the moles of sodium phosphate dodecahydrate comes out to be 0.131. Recall that we had to have more moles, like by one and a half times, because it's a three to two ratio, had to have more moles of barium chloride, so we need much more of the sodium phosphate than we have. So again, we'll be running out of sodium phosphate, it'll be limiting, and then all my calculations of the equation will be based on my barium chloride. Whatever I'm going to run out of dictates for me how much I get in the way of product. So let's take a look at a simulation and see how this works. This is one of those that you never quite know. I think it works. 
which will be given in the lab is an unknown solid mixture that looks absolutely nothing like this. It won't have red and yellow balls in it, but I'm pretending that's a mixture of sodium phosphate and barium chloride uh, the hydrates. And what you're going to do with that is you're going to take that and we're going to put it into water. So you just take this guy, dump him into water, what will happen with him is we're going to form that, that precipitate, that barium phosphate product will be forming that we can only form as much as, as the limiting reactant that we have. And so we, we can get this, what will happen is you dump it into water, all of a sudden you see this, you have solid on the bottom, it won't be black, it'll be white. You won't have red balls floating around, but that'll be whatever's left in excess in here, however, whatever thing is gonna be left over. And so there's a couple things we're gonna do. One of the things is we'll focus a lot of attention on how we're gonna get this precipitate out and cleanly as much as we can and also dry it out and get a mass for it. But the other thing we want to do is we want to figure out which one of these balls, the red or the yellow, we ran out of in doing this. And so if I take these two, just take this supernatant. Supernatant is a liquid above my precipitate. My precipitate is a solid in the bottom. My supernatant's up here. Split into a couple of test tubes, beakers, whatever they're going to be. There's nothing special about the shape of the glassware. And what I want to do is in one of them, I'm going to dump in the same, I'm dumping one of the reactants, doesn't matter which one. In this case, I dumped in one of the red balls. I dump it inside of here. If my red balls were in excess over here, then what happens is absolutely nothing. All I've done is put more red balls in it. I'm not going to see it happen. I won't see, will not see a precipitate on the bottom. If, on the other hand, I dump in some of the other reactant, uh, some of the other reactant in there, what I'll find out is that. Um, that I'll be forming a precipitate down on the bottom. It looks like this. I still have some red balls left over because they're in excess, not as many, but I still have some left over. So by this simple test, I can take and figure out that my precipitate, okay, my precipitate here told me that, that the yellow balls were actually the one that were the limiting reactant that I ran out of those. Or in the other way, when I think about it, if I use the red one and I get no precipitate, it means he was in excess. So if this was my sodium phosphate dodecahydrate up here and I dump it in that solution I get no precipitate that means sodium phosphate dodecahydrate is my limiting reactant okay. so in addition to the experimental part you're going to do here you also have some time where precipitate digest is going to sit in particles that get bigger and bigger it takes a little while for it to do that we're going to do some simulations of limiting reactant kind of get an idea of what happens so what we'll look at here is is we're using poker chips to represent atoms and that sort of thing so what you'll find is a set of poker chips that are different colors but you'll have them glued together so there's either one by itself or there'll be pairs or triples or trios or quad, uh, quartets that sort of thing and when you use these, just think of it as each one of those groups of poker chips is an atom. It just happens to have two or three or four poker chips in it. And all that does is changes the mass a little bit. And so, so when we talk about the mass of poker chips, we're just talking about how many are there glued together for that particular atom. Uh, when we're counting atoms, we're just counting how many groupings do we have inside of there. First, I want to show you a computer simulation of this to give you an idea of what sort of thing happens in a, uh, in a simulation, a computer type simulation. Let's look at a computer simulation of limiting reactants and give you some idea of what this looks like visually. Uh, you're going to include a simulation part in this lab and we'll see if that helps at all as well. But this comes from a place called fet.colorado.edu, p-h-e-t.colorado.edu. And when you open up the home page, you get something that looks like this. If you know what topic you're looking for, you can go up in here and just type in the idea. So I could type in here limiting reactant and go find a, a simulation that would help me. I can also go down here and it says play with simulations. And it'll give me a list. It's got physics, it's got chemistry, it's got earth science, it's got biology, it's got all sorts of things you can look at inside of it. And so when I go to the limiting reactant one, I've already opened it up, so it wouldn't take quite as long to do. But if I go to that one, it looks something like this. And so when it opens up, what you'll see on your screen is the sandwich shop thing. That's where you can look at making cheese sandwiches and things with different meats and all that sort of thing. Let's move over to the reaction part. The reaction part looks at three chemical reactions, making water, as written over here to the right, making ammonia, and making combu and combusting methane, just like your natural gas at your house. Let's go with the water. When I look at the water reaction, I'm going to put in some number of hydrogens and oxygens down here, and let's just crank it all the way up. I think they only take 10 all together, so you can use a little uh, 
uh, you can just scroll it up to 10 if you want to. You can type in the numbers however you want to do that. Think about this for a minute. If I have 10 hydrogen and 10 oxygen, 10 oxygen would require 20, okay, would require 20 hydrogens, twice as many. I don't have enough, which means I'm going to run out of my hydrogens in the end, okay? So I take a look at this and think about when they react. And on the other side here, it says after reaction, here's what happens. I take an oxygen here. This oxygen takes those two hydrogens there, for example. This one takes those two hydrogens there. This one takes these two hydrogens there. And when you do that, what you find out is that, and for every oxygen that you get, you get that reacts, you get two water. So that means that as I go look at my reaction here, if I react, I can only react five of these, then I'll get ten waters out of it. On the other side, what happens? There's my ten water molecules looking like this. And there are my five leftover oxygens because I didn't have any place to go with them. You'll see that summarized down below. And you can change your numbers around if I want to go down and think I'd only had, what if I only had six oxygens to start with? Well, I still have a situation where I think here about my oxygens. I still need twice as many hydrogens. So if I have, have 10 of these, I need 20. I still don't have enough hydrogen, enough hydrogen to make this happen. So I'm going to be limited over here in how much water I can make. So two of these will make two of those. That means if I react six of these, I should get six water molecules. And sure enough, I do. Just think of this pairing up. There's a water molecule. Here's a water molecule. Here's a water molecule. There's And so you get six of them over on this side. So you can play with different reactions, that sort of thing. If you're sort of competitive, you can go to the game mode. Of course, you're competing with yourself pretty much. And you can have different levels of difficulty in here, and you'll have your on, you'll have your timer, you'll have a speaker whether it's on or off, and whether you actually see the simulation or not, or whether you're just going to be working on it on your own. But it might be a way for you to kind of get get set up inside of here. Uh, I might point out here that all the reactions you'll find here, even in the game, will be one molecule of one thing and multiples of the other. They might also be twos and twos, threes and threes, fours and fours might be the same numbers on both sides, but you won't find one in these simulations say three and two. You get to play with that a little bit in your poker chips if you want to and kind of see what happens. What happens in, in this world is that if you're using these small numbered simulations, the threes and twos sometimes give you pause because all of a sudden you have two things left over. You can't don't have enough of A to make B or B to make A and kind of get that point. Keep in mind that in real life we're dealing with with all the number like molecules, numbers of molecules, and so that's not an issue for us at that level. This is what the day sheet looks like for your poker chip simulations, and as you notice up here, just initial numbers of atoms. Remember, you're just talking about counting poker chips, not not chips. You're counting clumps of poker chips, and so if something is three of them are glued together, that's one atom doesn't matter. Now, if it has three of them glued together, that may be one atom, but if I talk about the mass of it, three of them glued together is equal to three for a mass. And so up here, you'll be able to put in whatever reaction you want to and go ahead and experiment with whatever you want to. You might find some things that are kind of interesting in it and take an idea and kind of see how these things are related to each other. The next slide gives you a bit of another simulation of doing that. I'll show you how to do like a three to two ratio. One's what happens to work out perfectly, uh, but I'll show you how that one works on the next uh, next movie. To carry out the experiment we had earlier, which is 23 yellow chips and 20 of the doubled up black chips, I have what you see down here on the left hand side, the yellow chips along here, they're in stacks of five, except for him, he's in three. And on the other side, we've got four stacks of five doubled up black chips. Now, these are actually taped together, yours will probably be glued together by the time you get there. And so what we're going to do is do a reaction, <clears throat> and the reaction is similar to the sheet we had earlier. The reaction we had earlier was saying that we're going to take and react one yellow over here with two blacks over here and see what happens in the end. And so if I do that, I'll take one of the yellows and put them over here and take two of the black chips. And so that's one and that's two, looks like that. We'll put them like that so it looks good. And I'll do the same thing again. I take one of the yellows and two black chips from over here like that. Take two black chips down here, one of the yellows. I'll take two black chips here, one of the yellows. Take two more black chips over here, one of the yellows, two more blacks right here, and yellow, two, and the yellow, two, and the yellow, 
two more blacks, and yellow, two more blacks, and yellow. And now what you see is at this point we've run out of black chips and we still have yellow chips left. So at this point what we find out is that our black chips are a limiting reactant because we ran out of those. Our yellow chips were in excess. The amount of excess yellow chips we had were going to be one, two, three, four, five, however many that is. Should count as five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Thirteen yellow chips left over. And so I have thirteen excess yellow chips in there. And we can take and fill in the form that we had before, and I'll show you that in just a second. And it shows us how much we had left over, how much we made. We talk about the masses on this form, we're talking about how many chips. So the blacks each count as two masses because there's two poker chips inside of each one. Then you can take and change the ratio. If you want to do maybe three yellows to every two blacks and play around like that. You have to recognize this won't always come out perfectly. You won't always run out of just one at the end. But you kind of think of it in a mindset of I keep making the black one. Here I take two blacks, put a yellow, two blacks to put a yellow. When I can't do it anymore, the one I ran out of is going to be on limiting reactive. It works really well with moles of things because they have so many atoms and molecules in them. But if I wanted to get a mole's worth of poker chips, the mass of that would be about a fourth of the mass of the Earth. And there's nowhere enough, no way enough carbon in the Earth to even make that many to start with. And so we're kind of doing a simulation process. The result of that experiment looks something like this. What you'll see in here is we start with 23 of the yellow, we start with 20 of the black. When we got done, all the black were gone. There's our zero. We still had 13 of the yellow ones left over. In this process, we made 10 of these molecules. If you go back and think about the image, we only had 10 of the YB2 molecules. When I come down to here, in terms of the initial mass of the chips, I start with 23 of the Ys. Remember, there's only one chip in each Y. There were two chips in each B, in each black one, so that means 2 times 20 is 40, and I didn't have any of this to start with. Once the reaction's done, I still have 13 yellows left over, and since there's each one, one chip in each one, it's going to be 13 for the mass. I don't have any black left over, and when I count this up at the end, I've got, in YB2, I have one chip for the yellow, and then I've got two chips for each black, or that's a total of five chips inside of here. 5 times 10 is 50, looks like this. Notice that my mass before was 63, and my mass afterwards is still 63. Everything was conserved. Hope that gives you some idea of this limiting reactant experiment coming up. Uh, certainly give me any feedback you want to about what makes sense and what doesn't make sense, and everything will work out well. Thank you very much.